Okay, so I'm going to finish up here with the juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Um, here's a picture for you just showing you the um, uh, juvenile arthritis here and what, what you would find, you know, the bone and the cartilage with the synovial fluid, um, very uh, inflamed, you know, and... and um, just not a nice smooth appearance like in the uh, normal bone. All right, treatment and nursing care for JRA. The goal is to maintain mobility and preserve joint function. It includes drugs and physical therapy. Hopefully, again, you'll take a few minutes to look in the book and figure out which medications we would be talking about and that we may want to give our patients with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Um, one thing that we don't recommend is aspirin. Now, hopefully you guys can remember why we're not recommending aspirin. I'm going to look that up. But aspirin is not used anymore in children related to Rice syndrome, uh, which is a fatal disease that affects many organs, especially the brain and liver. We will use NSAIDs for joint inflammation. However, there are side effects to those as well. What are some of those side effects? Again, hopefully it'll take a few minutes, but those are going to be um, GI irritation and bleeding. Acetaminophen is often not appropriate. Why would acetaminophen not be, be inappropriate for a patient with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis? I mean, remember, acetaminophen is not aspirin, so this is different. Why would acetaminophen not be appropriate? Hopefully you realize acetaminophen is not appropriate because it lacks anti-inflammatory properties. The whole point is to try to decrease the inflammation. If we give them acetaminophen, we are not giving them any anti-inflammatories. We need to educate caregivers of the importance of regular administration, even when the child is not experiencing symptoms. Uh, the primary purpose of NSAIDs or aspirin is not for pain management, aspirin for the older um, patient, but NSAIDs for the child. The primary purpose for these NSAIDs is not for pain management, but to decrease the joint inflammation, which in turn causes pain. Okay, so be sure that you understand that. When NSAIDs are no longer effective, you're going to switch to the gold preparations, the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, and steroids. Physical therapy includes exercise, application of splints, and heat. And it requires cooperation from the family, the nurse, and the physical therapist. Um, joints must be immobilized by splinting um, during active disease, but you must do gentle daily exercise to prevent ankylosis. Hopefully you remember that ankylosis is joint immobility. Okay, so we are going to splint during active disease for immob immobilization. But even with the splinting, remember that we are going to have to do some gentle daily exercises to prevent ankylosis. Um, excuse me, we need to stress to caregivers the importance of encouraging the child to perform their ADLs and to maintain their function of independence. That's very important as well. Um, sometimes they just want you to do things for them because they're not, they're tired, they don't feel good, everything hurts, but we need to make sure that we encourage the child to perform their own ADLs, um, to maintain that independence. Okay. Ewing sarcoma. Ewing sarcoma is a malignant tumor found in the bone marrow of the long bones. This is most often found in school age or adolescent boys. And you can find information in Leifer here on page 569. Clinical manifestations and diagnosis. Injury draws attention to the pain at the site of the tumor. The pain may be sporadic, but continues to become severe, keeping the child awake at night. By the time the child's diagnosed, metastasis may have already occurred, usually has already occurred. Pain and swelling um, is what's going to, you know, this pain causes some swelling as well that's going to keep this ch child up. And it is very unfortunate that metast, metas you know what I'm trying to say, <laughs> that the, um, that is already metastasized by the time the child's actually been, actually been diagnosed. Diagnosis, um, a biopsy is going to be done in bone marrow aspiration to help um, confirm diagnosis. Um, what happened to 
I think I mentioned, started mentioning this in one of the other posts or whenever we discuss things, um, about, a, uh, an acquaintance that I know whose child had, um, has Ewing sarcoma. And the reason that they discovered it was somewhere right around Christmas time. And she and her sibling were just sitting down around the Christmas tree to look at the Christmas gifts under the tree. And when she sat down, her leg broke. Just the action of sitting down broke her leg. And they were like, this is so not right. Something is very wrong, obviously. Um, she'd been having some pain, but she was an athlete. And I thought maybe she had just, uh, sprained or twisted something. Um, you know, nothing severe or anything. She was still walking. But all of a sudden, she sits down and has this bone fracture. Okay, so here's a picture of Ewing sarcoma. Treatment and nursing care for Ewing sarcoma. The tumor is going to be removed and the patient will receive radiation with chemotherapy. Half of the children with Ewing sarcoma have a five-year survival rate, especially if there's no metastasis. Let me see what I can do on here. Hopefully I can still pull up some other um, pictures because I wanted to show you guys the pictures I would normally do in class for this. Mm, let's try this. Give me just one second. Um, Hmm. Sorry, give me just one second. And even with recording, it's easier for me to keep doing this than it is to stop the recording and restart it. Hmm. I may have to, I just saw those. All right, hold on just one second. Okay, so I finally found the pictures here that I wanted to show you. Um, back to Ewing sarcoma. So the treatment is that the tumor will be removed and the patient receives radiation and chemotherapy. And one of the ways that they may do this removal of the tumor, um, and this is what they did with the person that I knew, I don't know if my pictures are in order here, but we're going to look through them and see, is, um, well, they tried just doing a basic tumor removal initially, but what they ended up having to do was this resection, which I think I talked about last time, where they actually took out the above and below the bone or, or above and below the tumor. So, um, trying to decrease on the, um, make sure that they got all of the, um, tumor cells there. So they do this resection. So they take out above and below. And this is where hers was done as well up at the thigh and then down here at the ankle. And then what they'll do is they reattach the ankle to the thigh backwards. And what they do is they, this becomes the knee joint. So they'll attach, they do a lot of exercises to loosen that up enough to come down. And then this ankle becomes the knee for the patient. They put a prosthetic device right here on the foot. It's very, very interesting. Not done super frequently, obviously, but it has been done. And here's a picture of a person who had it done. They put this prosthetic on, they have it foot backwards, they put the prosthetic on, and then this patient is now able to run and play, okay? Here was the, my um, acquaintance, the person that I knew, here was her surgery. Okay, so here's where they did the resection, and they pieced it back together backwards. Here's the foot, okay? And all these are staples going all the way around, and these are they put this big rod through the bone. That's what that is. Okay, this is after the surgery. They have to keep pulse points open. So they had to feel for the um, coolness, you know, pulselessness, pallor. They have to assess the foot. And um, so this is what the nurses are doing. And they're using a Doppler here. And they'll go right in here. They leave this little hole to check the pulse to make sure that they're getting blood supply because here they've taken this section, huge section out of the bone, um, out of the patient's leg, and they're reattaching two separate pieces. So they have to make sure that the blood flow is still consistent to keep everything alive. Okay, so here she is laying in bed. There's her thigh. And this is what will be now 
become her knee. Okay, very painful surgery, obviously. You see she's got lots of JP drains in, um, trying to decrease the swelling and everything. Here she is up and walking a little bit. Okay. Oh, let's see, was that all of them? Yep, that's all that I have. She ended up developing multiple complications with this um, surgery. They weren't sure that this was going to survive. They went in. Um, it, there was some necrotic tissue. The, the blood flow wasn't real great. Um, she had to go in and do another surgery. And in fact, they had already decided they were just going to go in. And what they decided was the best thing to do is to go ahead and do a complete amputation and then do a prosthetic from up, up above here doing a complete amputation of all this that they had put together and then just doing a full prosthetic leg. Um, the day of the surgery, they went in, they took the wound back off, looked at the um, wound. I mean, she was scheduled. They saw her the day before. They went in and scheduled it the day of the surgery. They went in and started noticing that things were healing and, and getting better. And so they ended up not having to do that last surgery. And she was able to keep um, this procedure, this ankle foot, through a lot of therapy and everything, and she's in college now. All right, let's see if I can figure out how to get back. Okay. All right, moving on to scoliosis. This is on page 570 in Leifer. So scoliosis is a lateral curvature of the spine. Two forms include um, structural, structural and functional scoliosis. So structural scoliosis is rotated and malformed vertebrae. It's usually idiopathic, which means the cause is unknown. And then we have functional scoliosis, which is actually the most common type. Um, it is when you have poor muscle control or poor posture, muscle spasms from trauma or unequal length of the legs. When the primary problem is corrected, the functional scoliosis then resolves. All right. So here's a picture of scoliosis. So you'll notice here's your normal spine, nice and straight across the top. And here's your scoliosis deformity. You can see the curvature, but not only that, you can see this elevation in the scapula when they bend over. Diagnosis, excuse me, is based on screening exam. Exams begin in school usually around the fifth or sixth grade and should last throughout the eighth grade. And really don't notice too much of that in schools anymore. They used to do it in school. But now it's done during your school physical that you have to have done every year um, in, in middle school, in high school. Um, but exams should be completed during well-child checkups. Exams involve observing the undressed child from the back and noting any lateral curvature of the spinal column. Asymmetry to the shoulders. That's what we were talking about where you notice that elevation on one side. Um, uh, so an and or elevation of the hips and asymmetry of the hips um, an unequal distance between the arms and the waist the nurse then asks the child to bend at the hips to touch the toes and observe for the prominence of the scapula on one side and curvature of the spinal column so what are some considerations for this child though when we do this we're doing this frequently every year throughout middle school these are the teen years remember preteens um, so what types of things do we need to be real cautious about? All right, so hopefully things that you kind of will come up with are things such as maintaining privacy for the child. This is a very embarrassing thing. Um, privacy is super important to these children. So you always, um, they always are wearing their underwear and you put a gown on. And oftentimes the physicians will come and just kind of hold the gown taut and say, okay, now bend over and they'll take the gown with them and then they'll pull you back up by the gown so that the gown is held um, it's not hanging down so that everybody can see down the front of your gown and, and try to keep as much modesty as possible. All right. If we notice any issues, then we're going to evaluate every four to six months. Treatment is based on many factors and is either surgical or non-surgical surgical treatment. Um, Long term. Excuse me, treatment is long-term and lasts throughout the child's growth cycle. Curvatures 
Um, this is what important what you're going to need to know. So if you have a curvature of 0 to 25 degrees, there's no treatment, but constant observation. If you have a curvature between 25 to 40 degrees, you're usually going to get a brace or traction. And if you have a curvature greater than 40 degrees, we're talking surgery. Okay. Uh, electrical stimulation is an alternative for bracing the child, either applied to the skin or surgically implanted. Treatment occurs while the child is asleep. The leads are placed to stimulate the muscles on the convex side of the curvature to contract as the impulses are transmitted, causing the spine to straighten. What you need to make sure is that, especially because you're doing this at nighttime on these children typically, um, is checking under the skin or under the um, leads for skin irritation. So here's a picture of what I'm talking about. So these are the leads that would be placed on the child. So you need to make sure that you've checked these for any kind of skin irritation frequently. Okay, so remember to, um, you're going to need to know those different spinal curvatures when you would treat and how you're going to treat. Um, most common used braces are the Boston brace or the TLL, TLSO brace. They must be worn at all times except when the bathing or swimming. Um, and they must be worn over a t-shirt to protect the skin, okay? So a tank top or a white t-shirt or I don't know if you all even know what that is, but what we used to, what I've heard called wife beater t-shirts, those little skinny tank tops that people will wear um, to try to protect the skin at all times. All right, so what are some educational points for the child and family? Please, 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 I hope you're going to take a few minutes and pause the video and look it up in the book so that you'll get this a lot better. But I'm going to tell you the answers. <laughs> so um, educational points for the child with brace the brace. You need to check the child regularly and com to confirm a proper fit of the brace. We're going to observe for skin irritation, rubbing, or discomfort and adjust the brace as needed. Notify the physician of any reddened areas. Help the child move about safely. Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Help the child move about safely, moving up the stairs correctly, getting in and out of the cars, chairs, desks, and out of bed. While that seems a very simple task, it is not such a simple task with a brace when you're wearing a brace all the time. So teaching them, I mean, I'm sure they're going to figure it out, but if you teach them better strategies on how to get up from the bed, how to get out of a chair, how to get into the chair and the desk, um, without causing any falls or traumas, uh, goes much more smoother for the, for the child. Um, avoiding hazardous surfaces, slick surfaces or anything. The family should contact school personnel to ensure that the child has a comfortable seat and make adjustments for physical education class. So these can be, um, pardoned or there are certain activities the child can do even with the brace, but those things need to be discussed. All right. The brace will be worn for years, many times. The child is weaned gradually for one to, to one to two years by wearing at night only. Make sure that the, they know the importance of weaning compliance so that spinal correction is successful. It's kind of like braces on your teeth. You got to wear them all the time and then you wear a retainer at night to just kind of keep that correction in a line. Alignment, it's the exact same thing with these braces for um, scoliosis. So here's a picture of your Boston brace for scoliosis. So you can see how this is going to be uncomfortable and how you can cause issues getting in and out of desks or chairs or out of bed, okay? Here's your TLSO braces, okay? These are quite large and, and um, cover a significant portion of the body, okay? So education is very important. Scoliosis treatment continued with severe spinal curvature or cervical instability the child may be placed in halo traction. So halo traction involves steel pins inserted into the skull. We'll insert these pins into the skull while counter traction is applied um, by using a skin, a pin inserted into the femur. Weights are then gradually increased to promote correction. And the child needs education regarding body image disturbance because this is incredibly disturbing for people to see. Um, Encourage the child to discuss their feelings, help the child to select clothing that supports the current styles that needs to be loose enough for the brace um, or the traction and any extracurricular activities that could be done with the brace in particular. 
After surgery, we need to check neurovascular status of the extremities. If um, surgery, the child should expect a lot of pain. They should expect to lay flat for several days post-op. And the child's growth will be stunted related to the rods that are put in the spine. I mean, that's, it will be stunted. And here's a picture of halo traction for scoliosis. So this is a halo traction brace with padded plastic jacket here. Okay, and here's the other halo traction going into, so he's got the traction down here, going down here into the um, pelvis bones. So it's stabilizing from the head down here to the pelvis. Uh, it looks very painful. All right, approximately six months after surgery, the child can take part in most activities except contact sports. The child may need traction for one to two weeks prior to a brace, so they may only need that traction for a short amount of time prior to being put into a brace. And we need to encourage the child to perform exercises to help decrease the risk of immobility and promote self-esteem. Okay, just because they're in a brace doesn't mean we don't want them to ever move. We do still want movement, so we'll have to pro provide them with ways to do um, different exercises and, um, you know, decrease that immobility. Okay, so I think that I have covered everything for PEDS. Please, please send me emails if you have any questions about anything. Sorry this got broken up into two different um, PowerPoints. I started one and then got called away, and I couldn't figure out how to add to it, so I had to just start this new one to finish things up. Um, I'll send you an email if I have anything else to add on um, test question distribution, but please, please take the time to read through this material in LEFR, read through this PowerPoint. Please contact me if you have any questions. I really want you guys to do well on this on the final, um, so please let me know if you have questions on it. All right, thank you.